Welcome to the Quillette Podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Kay, a senior editor at Quillette. Quillette is where free thought lives. We are an independent, grassroots platform for heterodox ideas and fearless commentary. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so by going to quillette.com and becoming a paid subscriber. This subscription will also give you access to all our articles and early access to Quillette social events. Welcome to the Quillette podcast. I'm Jonathan Kay, speaking to you from Toronto. As some of you know, in late 2020, Quillette began collaborating with Think Inc., Australia's leading intellectual touring company, to bring you a regular series of speaking events under the banner Free Thought Live. What you're going to hear today is from a recent event hosted virtually by my boss, Claire Lehman, in which she interviews Michael Schellenberger, a prolific author, including here at Quillette, and also the founder of Environmental Progress, which advocates for nuclear energy as a clean and viable energy option. His most recent book is titled Apocalypse Never, Why Environmental Alarmism Hurts Us All. To learn more about this speaking series, just Google Quillette and Free Thought Live. Hi everyone, it's Susie from Thinking Care. We are so thrilled to have you here today for the event Eco-Modernism with Mike Schellenberger. This event is presented by our friends Quillette, led by the brave and brilliant Claire Lehman, who will be the host of today's show. Think Inc. are proud supporters of the show and our mission is to make the world better by raising rational discourse through live events. I loved Mike's book, which is available in the Think Inc. shop by the way. It challenged my perspectives and made me think and that is one of my favourite things to do. I suggest all of you who haven't read it yet to grab a copy. I also encourage you all to follow Quillette on Instagram and all other socials to keep up with their great work. I am so excited for today's show, so I won't keep you here any longer. Please let me introduce the founding editor of Quillette, Claire Lehman. Thank you, Susie. Hi, everybody. I'm Claire Lehman, editor-in-chief of Quillette. I'm so thrilled to be able to join you today with Michael Schellenberger. He's been an environmental activist for 30 years. He helped save some of the original redwood trees in California and helped draft the green stimulus component of Obama's Recovery Act. He's a veteran of the environmental movement, but now he's pushing back against some of the tactics, narratives and core assumptions of the environmental movement. I just finished reading his new book, Apocalypse Never, and I highly recommend it to anyone who hasn't got their hands on it already. So without further ado, please welcome Michael Schellenberger. Thanks for having me, Claire. Congratulations on the release of your book. Have you been surprised by the response? Yes. Yes and no. <laughs> I guess I'm, I'm surprised in a positive way in that it was a book that ended up selling pretty well, became a bestseller in the United States, Britain, um, in Australia, uh, which was exciting. And it was able to do that without really getting uh, a serious treatment by mainstream news media, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, which are both publications I've written for. And so I think that was unique. But I'm disappointed still that I think the left hasn't really addressed a lot of the main claims in it, though I have seen some influence on the discourse. For the most part, I wish that progressives would have confronted the content more than they have. Now, it's difficult to summarize Apocalypse Never. Some people describe it as pushing back against environmental alarmism, and that's a core part of it. But you're also embracing humanism and technology and industrialization. So it's also a testament to human ingenuity. And I haven't really seen reviews or arguments picking up on that part of it. I think in some senses, it's understandable in that I think people think that those are mainstream values. I think what my book does is it challenges the idea that many of the environmental policies that we think are good for the environment are consistent with those Enlightenment values. And I point out that, in fact, the main philosopher of modern environmentalism is an anti-Enlightenment thinker, Thomas Malthus, the British economist and philosopher. And he was a counter-enlightenment thinker and has been the most influential person in environmental policymaking for over 50 years. What made you come to the conclusion that Malthus is the most influential philosopher when it comes to the environmental movement? Well, he shows up, his ideas show up again and again. And I think uh, you shared something on Instagram that really summarizes the main finding here, which is that 
the people who are the most alarmist about climate change and other environmental problems are the same people who most strenuously reject the obvious solutions. So that would be the transition from coal to natural gas and nuclear for climate change. And it would be fertilizer for poor countries to grow more food on less land and protect their natural habitat. And for Malthus, it was opposing birth control, which would have and did play a major role in preventing the kind of overpopulation that he feared. And Malthusism casts a long shadow over the modern environmental movement. Do environmentalists explicitly embrace Malthus, or is it more of an implicit relationship with the philosopher? In some cases, it's very explicit. So the main response to Apocalypse Never from the scientific and environmental policymaking community was a defense of Malthus. In fact, they even put his painting on the cover of the response to me, which kind of shocked me because I thought that there would be more efforts to deny the connection and was surprised that that ended up being the most substantive criticism that the book got. Can you explain what Malthusianism is for those who aren't aware? Malthus's main idea was that a better future would not be possible with industrial progress and modernity because the rate of population growth would exceed the rate of agricultural productivity. And the obvious response to this back then was that we would use birth control to reduce the human population. And secondarily, we would grow more food on less land. And of course, both things occurred. While the population of humans is still growing, it's likely to peak at about nine, maybe 10 billion. And now we produce 25% surplus of food, and we struggle more with obesity and overweight than we do with hunger and starvation. So he's been repeatedly debunked, but his ideas, as I show in Apocalypse Never, have been recycled endlessly, suggesting that environmental problems can only be solved by significantly reducing the human population and or by reducing economic growth. And there were a couple of books in the 1970s, weren't there, that sort of rehashed his ideas, like The Population Bomb? Yeah, so this is a book that said in very explicit terms that there would be mass famine and starvation by the 1980s. It was published in 1969. You read it now, it's a bonkers book. I mean, you can't, I can't believe that it was even published and that professor at Stanford wrote it. But it was a huge phenomenon. The author went on Johnny Carson, which was our biggest late night TV show host, six times. It was debated in The New York Times. It was a major publication and its influence continues, which leads me to think that it will, that the ideas of Malthus will continue to have sway, even though his basic view has been repeatedly debunked. It's kind of a misanthropic philosophy, isn't it? It's this idea that we can't have too many people because we'll overrun the earth. But you you hear these narratives quite frequently, like the earth is finite, we can't sustain unlimited economic growth. Do all of these phrases trace back? (laughs) I mean, you can go past Malthus and certainly find golden age narratives, which described how for one reason or another, there would be some sort of an apocalypse. And you certainly found that in various religious traditions, including Judeo-Christianity with the Book of Revelations. So there have always been warnings of the end. But I think what Malthus did is he scientized it and put it into economic terms in a way that created legitimacy for the modern age. One thing that I found interesting was how you push back against some of the most alarmist and apocalyptic rhetoric by using the mainstream science, like the IPCC scientific reports. Tell us about how you don't necessarily dispute the science, but more the messaging around the science. I defend IPCC science. I defend mainstream science in every instance from the Malthusian scientists and activists, as well as from the alarmist journalists. And so the thumbnail of it is that climate change is real. It's something that we should deal with. It does create risks that should be addressed, but it's not the most serious environmental problem. It's certainly not our most serious problem that we face as a human, as human societies. Um, Other problems, deforestation, species extinction, are best dealt with through technologically advanced and intensified agriculture. 
and at the basic direction of travel of human societies since the Industrial Revolution is overwhelmingly positive, both for people and the natural environment. And so to give one example that is an underappreciated signifier of progress is that the amount of land that we use for meat production, we call pasture land, has peaked in the year 2000 and declined about the area uh, of the state of Alaska. That's huge because yeah. one of the greatest threats to endangered species around the world, including in New Zealand and in sub-Saharan Africa, in Latin America, comes from cattle ranching. And so the less land that you have to use to grow beef, the more endangered species will save. And if we continue that trend through intensified meat production, that means producing more beef on less land, we can have a very positive ecological future. And this is what I am so bothered by and what motivated so much of Apocalypse Never is that a positive environmental future is not only possible, it's likely, and we can accelerate the transition to it if we embrace technology and progress rather than shun it. So free range organic farms are not the best idea if you're talking about more cattle on less land? Unfortunately, places like Napa or Tuscany or Provence are not the kind of farms that are highly efficient, productive farms. Mm. And so in some ways we can choose, we can have a planet that looks a lot like the vineyards of vacation places and agriturismo, or we can choose some amount of habitat for wildlife. We'll end up doing a mixture of both, but I think people need to understand that, th that this is one area where there is a direct environmental trade-off. Now, this resistance to the idea of progress turns up over and over and over again. Steven Pinker had to deal with it when people reacted to his book, Enlightenment Now. There was sort of this incredulity that things have gotten better since the Industrial Revolution, since trade and commerce have flourished. Why do you think there's such a deep-seated and entrenched skepticism that things like trade, innovation and technology have actually brought us a wonderful standard of living. It comes from a desire to play what psychologists sometimes call the rescuer role. It's a heroic role, and the rescuer requires a victim. And it requires, and to be exaggerated as a rescuer, in an affluent society where many of the big problems have been addressed, then I think that rescuer role has become more empowered and ambitious and aggressive. So the rescuer role now needs to take over all of Portland, Oregon. Mm. You know, it needs to dominate public spaces. And then once it gets control of those public spaces, it doesn't really know what to do. It doesn't have any vision for governing. So it's a very nihilistic rescuer impulse that mm. is unaware of itself as a religious movement, as a kind of move to gain purpose and meaning. And that ultimately, I think, is what's, what drives the apocalyptic environmental movement and impulses. You were once apocalyptic in your thinking or verging towards that line of thinking and you stopped yourself because you realized it wasn't good for your mental health. Can you tell us a little bit more about that process that you went through? Sure. <laughs> By the way, it was only one sentence okay. in the book. It's not a, uh, it's not a memoir, but sure. um, I think what I say is I was most apocalyptic about climate change when I was most unhappy for reasons that didn't have anything to do with climate change. And I think that's common. I don't think yeah. I'm super unusual. I think we see that with Greta Thunberg, unhappy adolescents seeking to gain purpose and meaning in their lives, which is a totally noble impulse. But it manifesting in a kind of extreme and kind of manic way. Obviously, asking people to panic, I think, is a kind of mania. And so, yeah, for me, I think there was both uh, some depression and some, I don't want to say in a clinical sense, because I think that would um, diminish much more severe forms of anxiety and depression, certainly than I felt. But, but nonetheless, I think the periods of unhappiness, I would say, were also characterized by more extreme and apocalyptic views. And again, I don't think that's unusual. I think we see that in a lot of particularly left wing political movements, which are, again, about people wanting to feel powerful as rescuers, maybe because it's a lot easier than dealing with the problems in their own life. That makes a lot of sense. And it resonates with some of the essays that we've published at Colette by people who have been radical Marxists, not radical environmentalists, but they say the exact same thing. When it comes to encouraging people to panic. I think you make a good point that it's unethical 
But we have been living through a very tough year. You know, obviously we're living through the pandemic. And earlier this year, where I live, we had these massive bushfires. And in your state, you've had the extreme forest fires. And so we are having to encounter events which do make us panic. Now, your argument is that extreme weather isn't increasing. Can you summarize that argument for us? Sure. There's really two separate categories that people need to keep in mind. One is natural disasters, which are strictly measured as deaths, mortality per 100,000 or whatever, um, and then also as property damage. And that's natural disasters. And then there's extreme weather events, which is how big is the hurricane? How frequent is it? How intense is it? How much more water is there in flooding? And so what you can have is you can have increasing extreme weather events, which there's some evidence for, and have natural disasters getting better. And that's basically what's been going on. So deaths from natural disasters have declined over 90 percent over the last 100 years, even as the population quadrupled. Very few people die in cyclones and hurricanes anymore. And those were two of the biggest in flooding. Is that because warning systems have improved and people just evacuate quicker? That's the main one. Storm shelters as yeah. well and better infrastructure. Yeah. But it is incredible. Just the low cost of weather forecasting. So you'd call it societal preparedness. Yeah. And then in terms of forest fires, we've had a huge accumulation of wood fuel in forests in mm -hmm. Australia and California because of poor forest management. We put out forest fires that were good when we should have let them burn the woody debris. And the reason we know that is because well-managed forests in California, and I presume in Australia, though I haven't checked, survived the fires. The high intensity fires went into the well-managed forests and then they dropped to the ground and became low intensity fires. And so what I would say is that the accumulation of wood fuel in forests is a necessary and sufficient condition mm. for the high intensity fires that we saw. Climate change is neither necessary nor sufficient. It's not necessary nor sufficient, but it could be an aggravating factor. Would you agree? Yeah, I think it is a factor. I just am re I'm resistant to putting it on the same level as wood fuel. Sure. In Australia, after our bushfires or during our bushfires, I was doing some reading about it and people have resisted back. We call it backburning here. People resisted backburning because of the smoke, because of the air pollution. So on the one hand, there's this resistance to a management tactic that would control fires or help control fires because of pollution. But on the other hand, people are wanting to blame an environmental cause for the bushfires. So it's sort of ironic. I'm not sure if anything like that has occurred in California where people actually resist controlling the forest because of the air pollution factor. Yes, it's identical. And so that has been a big factor. I think it's been changing some but I mean, it's ironic because before Europeans came, California was very smoky. We know yeah. this because when the Europeans came, they complained of how smoky it was. They didn't mm. like it. Mm. And so I think we associate smoke with industrial pollution mm. and degradation. And in reality, smoke is natural and necessary for our forest ecosystems, for most forests, actually. Mm. They need some amount of fire. So. I've been reluctant because at first, when I was debunking some of this stuff, I would point out that we haven't had significant increases over a long-term period in the area burned. But then I stopped saying that because it made it sound like I was saying that that was a good thing. I didn't want to contribute to the demonization of fires. And so it's, a, it's an issue that requires some of that nuance. Hmm. And I think it's been another case of where the ignorance of the average person the ignorant belief that fire is bad has been yeah. manipulated mm -hmm. and led people to think that we're in a kind of hell. One thing that really fascinated me about Apocalypse Never was the unholy alliance that you expose between people who have made a great deal of money through fossil fuels, who then invest in renewables, who then lobby to get nuclear plants shut down. That whole chapter on the governors in California who had oil money 
and who got nuclear plants shut down. That just blew my mind. Do you want to summarize that chapter? Sure. So the governor of California for 16 years, Jerry Brown, his father and the family had the oil concession from the Indonesian dictatorship from the 1960s on. And also they had natural gas assets. And they had always fought to shut down the nuclear plants, which would have directly replaced first petroleum and then natural gas. And people sometimes say to me, well, Michael, don't you think that Jerry Brown was genuinely anti-nuclear? And the answer is, of course. But, you know, the conquistadores, they were genuinely Catholic. So, I mean, the entire renewables lobby is in a in basically an open public alliance right now with natural gas companies, including BP and Shell, actively building solar plants and working with Greenpeace to shut down nuclear plants. And one thing I learned through Apocalypse Never, which I had not heard about anywhere else, is that renewables produce toxic waste. Well, it's actually much more toxic than nuclear waste in the sense that nuclear waste is the only waste byproduct from energy production that is safely stored and that never hurts anybody. Whereas we know now that solar panels and batteries are being sent to poor communities in Africa in particular that then use the solar panels for a few more years, the end of life, and then they can either get smashed up and used for the valuable materials within, which is mostly the copper wire, but then that exposes people to lead, which is used for the soldering um, of solar panels and it becomes a toxic waste problem. In fact, as soon as the solar panels come off your house, and this is as true in Australia as it is in California, they become hazardous waste. And right now they're just set to go to the landfill because usually when you take them down off of roofs, they break apart. They really don't last long. I mean, I think people think they last a long time, but really most panels, we use them for just 20 years. You know, nuclear plants can run for 80 years. And now a message from Blinkist, the app that distills the essence from over 4,000 best-selling non-fiction books and brings them to you in 15-minute text and audio explainers. As part of my job at Quillette, I need to be conversant about what books my readers and listeners are talking about, in part because a lot of the authors of those books end up on this podcast. But life is busy. Blinkist lets me dive into a topic quickly and find out how to deploy my reading time best. Blinkist also has teamed up with popular podcast creators to blink those podcasts for you too. And yes, the company uses the word blink as a verb like that. It's a thing. By blinking a podcast using a feature called shortcasts, you can get to the heart of an episode quickly, complete with high quality audio. You can jump right in on the go during your commute, at the gym, around the house, or even download to listen offline. 15 million people are already using Blinkist to broaden their knowledge in 27 nonfiction categories, including self-improvement, personal growth, management, leadership, and mindfulness. And like I've told you before, the length of a typical Blinkist abridgment is just 15 minutes, about the length of time it takes me to walk my dog. Some of my recent favorites include The Mosquito, A Human History of Our Deadliest Predator by Timothy C. Weingard, Becoming by Michelle Obama, and The AI Economy by Roger Boodle. Right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash Quillette to start your free 7-day trial and get 25% off a Blinkist premium membership. That's Blinkist, B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash Quillette to get 25% off and a 7-day free trial. Blinkist.com slash Quillette. And now, back to our podcast. And the key difference between nuclear energy and renewable energy, which you articulate in the book, is energy density. Now, that was a concept I did not have my head wrapped around before I read the book. Why is energy density so important? Energy density explains almost everything that you need to know about the impacts of energy on the environment. There's a related measure, which is power density. That's how much electricity per unit of land. And similarly, that explains agriculture. So what you want is we want high power densities, 
because if you have higher energy density fuels, higher power density farms and factories and cities, you are using less natural resource. You're using less materials. You're mining less. You're using less land. Mm -hmm. And so this single concept, which is just a simple physical principle of, in the case of energy density, the fuel content, or in the case of uh, power density, the electricity. So, you know, to give you a sense of it, you know, a glass of uranium, it's, it's not liquid, but if it were, if it were solid uranium, that's enough for my entire high energy life, including all of my jet travel, which is a miracle. That's what the miracle of nuclear energy is. By contrast, you need literally a million times more coal to produce the same amount of electricity. Wow. You need 400 times more land to generate the same amount of electricity from a solar farm or a wind farm as from a nuclear power plant. And batteries don't really pick up the slack, do they? Every time you use a battery, you are adding one energy conversion and then another energy conversion. So you're making the system much less efficient and adding to the cost and then adding much more material throughput. Why hasn't there been a pivot to nuclear? Is it just because of the fear of radiation, nuclear waste, or has there been more vested interests involved in preventing that pivot? Yeah, there's really three different motivations for the opposition to nuclear. The first is financial. If you have nuclear, you don't need renewables and you don't need natural gas. You can be like France. The second issue has to do with power. If you don't need renewables, then you don't have political donations and political constituencies. And then the third thing is, is that nuclear presents a spiritual challenge. I, I know that's a funny word to use, but the power that nuclear gives humans is unlike any power we've had. And that's just absolutely terrifying to many people. And mm -hmm. it, it, nuclear weapons should be terrifying. That's how they work. <laughs> that's yeah. what deterrence is. Yeah. And I think it's I think it's hard for people to decouple mm. nuclear weapons from nuclear energy. Do you think that once the baby boomers have all retired, because they grew up afraid of nukes because the Cold War was on, do you think once they've all retired and younger people come through who didn't grow up living under that blanket of fear, perhaps there will be increased acceptance and embrace of nuclear technology? Yeah, I said that to my mostly millennial staff. And then I think two weeks later, HBO announced the Chernobyl series. So I, I joke sometimes, it seems like every generation wants to traumatize its children about yeah. nuclear. And yeah. I guess all I would say is I think that Chernobyl on HBO was less terrifying than the films that they made those of us in Generation X watch. Yeah. And I think the films that we had to watch were, were much less terrifying than the films that baby boomers had to watch. So yeah. what I would say is I suspect the fear of nuclear will continue to echo, but that the echo will be softer each time. And going back to Chernobyl, it's quite remarkable when you actually look at the figures of how many people who have died from nuclear accidents. There aren't actually that many people, are there? It's shocking. It really is. So about 50 firefighters killed the night of the accident and in the following months. And then the only cancers that resulted were thyroid cancers, where the mortality rate is 1%. It's very low. And so we think somewhere around 150 people have died or will die from thyroid cancer from Chernobyl. And anything beyond that uses a methodology that I think is discredited. It's called linear no threshold which means that any amount of radiation causes damage. And we know that that's not true because I'm from the state of Colorado and we have some of the highest radiation in the United States and we have the longest lives. To give us some perspective, are you aware of how many people die every year from breathing in fumes from burning wood? The best estimates from the World Health Organization put that number at around 2 million lives shortened per year from breathing wood and dung smoke. About 2 billion people use wood and dung on a regular mm. basis. Mm. And then another 4 another four billion have their lives cut short from fossil fuels. And a really important part of your book, which I haven't seen drawn out or even mentioned in left-wing media, is how you champion 
the development in poorer nations and how you advocate for them to develop on their own terms. And so you argue that it's not fair to expect poorer nations to leapfrog over from not using coal to straight into renewables. Can you explain that concept? Most countries pass through similar transitions. So we start with wood and dung, and then we use hydroelectric dams, which are the most reliable and efficient form of renewable energy. And then we might use coal plants. And then we've transitioned gradually from coal to both petroleum and natural gas. And then eventually you reach the the highest level, and that's France. Nuclear. <laughs> <laughs> and so I don't, the one thing we all agree on, we could not have had the industrial revolution with renewables. They just didn't produce enough energy. People that are the real strong advocates of renewables are making an argument against industrial civilization, but in stealth fashion. There's romanticism in it mm -hmm. that we're harmonizing with nature, but the romanticism is really around moving back towards a lower standard of living that we had under an agricultural economy. Many of these champions of moving backwards in time actually live quite extravagant lifestyles themselves. Well, and I think it's hard to believe that these celebrities that flew to Sicily to attend a workshop put on by Google about climate change were unaware that jet travel is their single largest source of carbon emissions. It's yeah. something that is in the news media all the time. I, I don't believe it. So they will purchase offsets. They want to be rescuers and they want to be given credit for everything. So they want credit for going to Sicily for having this meeting. They want credit for having bought offsets. And they get very upset when people point out the hypocrisy. We have a contributor to Quillette called Rob Henderson, who's coined this term called luxury beliefs. And what he's done is he's taken Veblen's theory of conspicuous consumption and applied it to moral beliefs. He sees people of the upper middle class espousing these moral beliefs that don't cost anything for them personally, but if someone with less financial means were to espouse them or to live by them, they would be very costly indeed. So I wonder if environmentalism fits into that, or some aspects of environmentalism fit into that framework. Absolutely. You can kind of get away with a very apocalyptic story while also suggesting that you are acting heroically. And so it's definitely a power move. I think it's also motivated by a significant amount of anxiety around what's happening in the world. It's clear there's some amount of it that's a re reaction to the end of the Cold War. And then I think, again, more recently in the reaction to the Trump presidency and Brexit. Have you found it's easier to persuade those on the radical left to be less alarmist? Or is it easier for you to persuade hardcore climate skeptics on the right that climate change is actually a real thing? It's a real problem. By far, it's the latter. My book has been mostly read on the right. It's interesting experience, but it's it's nice because I do hear from a lot of people who will kind of say, I don't really agree with you about climate change, but they agree with me on so many other issues that it's not really a question. And, you know, the U.S. Republican Party in particular knows that it needs to have a better environmental agenda and a better climate change agenda. I find it interesting that if people accept money from any foundations associated with fossil fuels, they're immediately demonized and their work is dismissed as being tainted. But you identify in your book that many environmental NGOs themselves are funded by fossil fuel companies. Two of the biggest donors to the Democratic Party of the United States, Mike Bloomberg and Tom Steyer, are both heavily invested in natural gas and renewables. And nobody talks about it. It's a total double standard. One thing that made me think twice about environmentalism is learning that China was by far the greatest emitter of carbon emissions and that the United States and Europe have been in decline. And I was wondering, why don't environmental activists lobby their governments to lobby China to put tariffs on China to reduce their emissions when they're the single biggest culprit? I have a lot of problems with China. I, we should be more alarmed about China for military and economic reasons. 
But I think the carbon emissions are mostly just a function of where they're at in their stage of development. And that as they continue to grow wealthy, they will use more natural gas and nuclear and they will also see their carbon emissions decline. So what you're saying is that countries go through a process of development and burning a lot of coal is an inevitable step in that process. But once they get to that point, go through that process of industrialization, then they have the luxury of relying on more dense energy sources. The main thing that I would say that's changed is that natural gas has become so much more abundant and cheap. And so there's the real possibility that many poor countries Sub-Saharan Africa particularly can go right from wood and dung to natural gas okay. and can skip coal. You know, Rwanda's looking at a nuclear plant. And while I think it'd be great for Rwanda to have a nuclear plant, I don't see it happening, even though I think that's a heck of a lot more possible than leapfrogging to solar panels. And now a promotional message from another podcast, The Jordan Harbinger Show. The podcast where human interest and the world of ideas find their ideal balance. There's a reason Jordan's show was named a top podcast by Apple in 2018. Recent episodes have brought listeners issues like the heartless art of forced organ harvesting, schizophrenic mother, a duty like no other, and why we believe weird things by Quillette author Michael Shermer. If this sounds interesting to you, and I don't know why it wouldn't, look up The Jordan Harbinger Show wherever you listen to your podcasts. That's H-A-R-B like Bob, I-N-G-E-R. And now back to our Quillette podcast. You've mentioned that the hyper-focus on climate change is disproportionate and we have other problems that we need to focus on. What are some other environmental problems that we should be focusing on? One that is grossly neglected is the health of our oceans. We eat too many wild fish and demand for wild fish is going up. And the only way we know how to meet that demand is with farmed fish. And so we need to have a significant expansion of farmed fish in order to keep more wild fish in the oceans and allow for sea life that depend on that fish stock. And that's something we don't focus on enough. And many environmental groups have opposed fish farms, even though they've gotten much better and are really, really important for protecting wild fish species. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing I would say, it'll sound a little strange, but I think that One of the most important environmental questions is how do we help really poor countries to industrialize, particularly with clothing factories or what you might call sweatshops? And I wrote this part. uh, You and I were at an event last year and I spoke to some young women that felt guilty for buying clothes made in developing countries. I said, that's not right. You should want to buy clothes made in developing countries because you're creating jobs for young women in the cities who are then able to spend money on food, and that results in agriculture becoming more intensified and protecting more natural area. And so for me, it sounds strange, but increasing manufacturing in poor countries, whether it's Ethiopia or the Congo or Indonesia or the Philippines, is really an important environmental question, and and we should stop demonizing fast fashion. What I want to finish on is tell me about how you've managed to convert one of the most hardcore environmentalists in Extinction Rebellion in the UK over to being pro-nuclear and coming to work with you at Environmental Progress. Zion Lights is the uh, Europe Director of Environmental Progress. Uh, she, We offered her a promotion and a permanent role as Europe Director because she's been so effective in making the case for nuclear in Britain. What can I say? She's a force of nature, and I am glad to have met her, but I take no responsibility for her having changed her mind about nuclear. She was already pro-nuclear when I interviewed her, and she is her own person. I'm very excited because she's somebody who I trust so much and I respect so much that she requires very little supervision. Mm. And I think she represents, for me, the maturation and evolution of the pro-nuclear movement. For a lot of times, people would just sort of give me credit for things. And now I think it's clear that there's truly people around the world that are pro-nuclear. It's been really one of the most positive experiences of my year has been to work with Zion Lights and to watch her. She calls our politics pro-human environmentalism. 
eco-modernism is a little bit of a mouthful for a lot of people. And I think Zion really gets it right. I saw that Oliver Stone praised your book as being one of the most important books of the time. Is there going to be a film in the works? I would love to make it into a television series, but the universe wants me to write another book. So we have not been able to secure a TV deal, though I would like to still. But instead, I have, I'm have i happy to announce that HarperCollins will publish a book that I'm writing on the homelessness crisis, what we call homelessness in San Francisco. But it will be a larger book about the future of the social contract, mm-hmm. asking kind of what do we owe each other as Americans? I think there's some significant structural changes going on in our societies and our politics are still stuck in the 60s and and, and 80s and they need to evolve. And I think Quillette's obviously been a big part of that conversation, but you see it everywhere. And so I'm eager to write this book and speak to a particular problem, but also try to say something about the broader hunger for why should America exist rather than not exist? And what is our role and our purpose? in taking care of each other and and being good Americans. Well, I can't wait to read that book. Thanks so much for taking the time to speak with us today. It's been a fascinating experience for me and I loved your book and I highly recommend to everybody who's watching to go out and buy Apocalypse Never. Thanks for tuning in. Cheers. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Quillette Podcast. Quillette is where free thought lives. We are an independent, grassroots platform for heterodox ideas and fearless commentary. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so by going to quillette.com and becoming a paid subscriber. This subscription will also give you access to all our articles and early access to Quillette social events.